Well, friends, we're continuing in our series on anger, and I would imagine if we were to go around, it's not really hard for us to imagine and picture moments where anger causes bad things to happen, right? I mean, anger causing bad things to happen, there's like, okay, well, um, historically, there have been these things called wars. They're bad. A lot of anger behind them sometimes, you know? Um, There's newsworthy stuff. I feel like um, it encourages me not very much to follow, but I do follow Fredericksburg and Stafford police um, on my social media, and it's just like, crime and murder and all kinds of hatred and anger kind of coming out there as well, yeah. And then, of course, you've seen somebody lose their cool on Route 3 because, for goodness sakes, Route 3 at the right time of day is the wrong time of day, yeah? And uh, you're just stuck there forever. And so you've seen people, you've seen bad things happen in anger, I'm sure, yes? Yes, okay. That's all like that stuff, though, but we could be much more personal with our list if we wanted to of bad things that have happened in anger in our lives, personal, yeah? In fact, we could have whole like categories and create whole lists with categories. So there could be like the category of, okay, let's think of all the things from your childhood where you saw anger create some bad things, yeah? Like some of us would have some lists, yes? Or what about like in uh, high school? Forget childhood, let's go to high school. You being angry, other people being angry, you could come up with a list of bad things that happen sometimes. Or maybe let's do a category of family, Now, again, for some of us, it would be so hard to imagine anger in our family ever creating bad things. But for some of us, anger in family has had some some history, yeah? Or dating and marriage. Anger sometimes shows up there on occasion. Um, Or with with work, yes? There could be a whole list of work or, or people we no longer talk to. That could be a whole list of angry things and bad things. Or um, things that we most regret saying or doing while we were angry. We, we could come up with lists of bad things that could happen because of anger. Yes? Yeah. Regrets come in all shapes and sizes. I understand that, and you do too. But for sure, anger and regret have a very symbiotic relationship sometimes. So not all regret comes from anger, but anger can definitely lead us to a lot of moments of regret. And um, that's why at week one of this series, if you haven't been here, please go back and watch these online because this series, I think, is really going to be helpful for a lot of us. But in week one, we looked at what anger really is. And we looked at how some of us are going to go, oh, I'm not really angry. I'm not really an angry person because you don't throw things and scream a lot. But that's not the only way that anger can show. In fact, we realized that anger can show up in a lot of different ways and it can do a lot of damaging and dangerous things. It's a foothold, God has told us, to a lot of sin. And so it may not always be sin in of itself, but it sure can lead to plenty of sin, yeah? And so that's why in week one we said, what if anger wasn't your Achilles heel, but was more of like an ally that you knew how to like use for the right things? Today, we're going to get into practically how to do that, just so you know. So week one was kind of setting that kind of framework. Today, we're going to actually go into this in just a second. But, um, but last week, before we got to this retooling anger, last week it was like, hold on a second. I think we need to, we need to make sure that we recognize If you want to retool anger, the least amount of retooling you have to do, the better. Y'all tracking with me? So more anger isn't a better thing. And we talked about last week how, you know what leads to a lot of anger? My inflamed self-focus. I'm talking about me. Not Your anger doesn't lead from from my self-focus. But my anger leads from a self-focus issue. And uh, we need to deal with that because less is best when it comes to anger. So less offense in your life, I know some of you already know this, right? But like less offense in your life is better than more offense. Okay, thank you. Uh, so that's how we get to um, today because if anger is still going to happen and there's a way to actually get it, get the best of it rather than it getting the best of us, then I want to learn how to do that. So today we're going to be really practical. It's called How to Retool Anger to Do Good. And, um, and I think we can struggle with anger because of two things. I think because we lack the tools sometimes and we lack the self-control to do what we're supposed to do. And so I really wish we had a lot more time because I really want to make sure that you understand self-control is a, is a fruit of the Spirit. And so without the gospel, let me just say it succinctly, but make sure you hear it profoundly, okay? Without the gospel taking root in your life, you can't hack this whole thing on your own. You can't hack anger, I believe, really, without the Holy Spirit helping you going, let's continue to grow some self-control in you. Because it really, as you're going to see today, it's going to take some moments where you're going to be like, mm, mm, mm control thyself, okay, but you are not as good at controlling yourself as the Holy Spirit working inside of you, and so the gospel is critical, but self-control, while it is something that he does, you obviously play a part, hence why it's called self-control, and so there's a development, and we're going to get into the the practice of this development, but here's the tools today that we're going to use to help us get somewhere 
to knowing how to handle this. So, um, because I think many of us have never learned how to handle anger positively. And that's the problem is we just, we weren't taught how to handle anger properly. And we also didn't see it demonstrated in front of us. If you demo it for me, I can see it. Anybody else like this? Like basically in life, if you, sh- could you just show me how to do the thing? Like I hate when people try to tell me for 20 minutes. I'm like, just do it once. Just show me. And some of us, we never got to see that. All we got to see when it came to anger was, oh, that's how to blow up and really tell someone off. Or that's how to lose your cool. Okay, okay, okay. And so we've just seen bad examples, some of us, more than we've seen good examples. And so today, as we go to the scriptures, I actually want to use a bad example to help us learn today. Uh, Yeah, the possible first account in the human history of anger is a classic one. It's Genesis 4. You probably heard this one before. So let's look at Genesis 4 and get into these brothers called Abel and Cain. Anybody ever heard of these guys? Yeah, classic anger story here. Um, So basically, Eve's uh, in the first verse, she's going like, what? I can create too? Because for all she knew, God was the only one creating. And then she gets to create too. Pretty cool. But anyway, in verse 2, it gets to this part. Where now Abel, Abel was a keeper of sheep and Cain a worker of the ground. In the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground. And Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very, he was very what? Oh, that's a good word for our series here today. So he's very angry and his face fell. Now, here's the thing. I'm not going to actually postulate of what it might have been that was the reason for why God um, acknowledged Abel's sacrifice and not Cain's. That's for another conversation, another day. I will just say that Cain is apparently feeling Thank you. Angry. And we don't entirely actually know why. He could be possibly angry at himself for not doing a good job. Anybody else been there before? Or he could be angry at God. Like, God, I'm doing all the right things and you're not seeming to accept it. Anybody else? Yeah, that could be a possibility. Or he could be angry at Abel. He could be angry at a combination of those. But either way, all we know is that the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your face fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin is crouching at the door. Its desire is contrary to you, but you must rule over it. You must rule over it. Now, we're not going to stop there. Let's keep going. Cain spoke to Abel, his brother, and many uh, transcripts it'll say um, to invite him to go out to a field. Not a good invitation, but he didn't know that. And when they were in the field, Cain rose up against his brother Abel and killed him. And then the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? He said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And the Lord said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying out to me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the ground, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it shall no longer yield to you its strength. You shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, man, my punishment is greater than I can bear. Behold, you've driven me today away from the ground, and from your face I shall be hidden. I shall be a fugitive and a wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. And then the Lord said, Nana, if anyone kills Cain, vengeance shall be taken on him sevenfold. And the Lord put a mark on Cain, which again, we're not getting into because scholars, just we don't know, and I'm not going to guess. Something lest any who found him should attack him. Then Cain went away from the presence of the Lord and settled in the land of Nod, which, just fun fact, means wanderer, east of Eden. So here is Cain, possibly angry at himself. Would that make sense? Yeah, possibly angry at God, but that that would make sense too, right? Possibly angry at Abel, possibly a combination of all those. Who knows? We really don't know. Regardless, unequivocally, he didn't handle his anger well. Agreed? See, God had warned him, and yet still Cain let anger get the best of him. And it really did, truly. That's why we're kind of subtitling this series about getting the best of him, because it, it got the best of him. He's now in exile. He is now loaded with guilt. He's a wanderer who doesn't have his own land, and he's hated by others to the point that he's genuinely afraid somebody's going to try and kill me. Anger got the best parts of Cain and robbed, steal, stole, and killed and destroyed, all of it. So anger can be crouching at our door too, at someone you know or maybe someone you don't know, at a situation or et cetera. Anger can be crouching at our door, but we have to rule over it because when we don't, it ends up ruling over us. And when whatever that happens, um, 
and whatever bad thing got us here to that point of anger, when anger rules over us, it gets worse. Yes, bad decisions happen, which is why Marcus Aurelius, um, a Roman Stoic philosopher and emperor, once said, how much more grievous are the consequences of anger than the causes of it? Right? How many more times have you gone ahead and whatever got you angry was bad, but your anger and how you handled it got it even worse? Made it even worse. And so here's what's going to happen today. I'm going to get real practical. I almost got the chair out. I kind of wish I would have because I want to do a little more teaching today. And I'm actually going to borrow a lot from this book here. Uh, It's called Anger by Gary Chapman. It's one of the books and one of the resources I use to study for this series. Highly recommend. It's just a really good book by a Christian counselor on dealing with anger. And uh, today, in these five steps, I want to practically look at how we can hack our anger. From a biblical standpoint, how we can hack our anger. Yeah? We're going to jump right in because we don't have time for nonsense. So no nonsense today. (laughs) All right. Here we go. Number one, consciously acknowledge to yourself that you are angry. The first step to hacking our anger, consciously acknowledge to yourself that you're angry. See, God helps Cain out doing this in the first story by actually verbalizing it here. He asked Cain about his anger, right? Yes, somebody? He asked asked Cain, why are you angry? So he's acknowledging, hey, you're angry. It's basically God calling a spade a spade. And interestingly enough, in the story, sin is crouching at the door. It hasn't pounced yet. So it's not like him being angry is in and of itself a sin. Cain's anger isn't intrinsically sin, but God knows, and he's trying to tell him, sin is ready to capitalize on your anger. So let's let's acknowledge that you're angry, Cain. One of the best initial things that we can do is to simply acknowledge the sense, the energy that we're starting to feel, and just kind of go, I'm angry. Just saying it. I'm angry. Anybody? Like you, because it takes a little bit of guts sometimes to do that, especially if you tend to feel like sin is, or like anger is sin, or if you have a fear of confrontation, which I know some of y'all do. Um, then it's kind of like, oh, I don't know what to do with this. I don't know if I want to acknowledge this. And here's the problem if you don't acknowledge it, if you kind of like, I just want to avoid it, I want to kind of, you're going to internalize it. And, uh, and actually, I had a happenstance moment where I ran into the Knowles at Walmart the other day. Um, we were talking about my sermon, because that's what pastors do sometimes when you run into them at Walmart. Be careful. And I was talking about how, in this sense, when we internalize, we implode, potentially. And it's not as dramatic, maybe, as exploding. But either way, there's floating. <laughs> yeah. You're just like, don't say that. And I, I was like, yeah, I won't. And then I did. Because um, either way, if you look at a, um, a building that's being demoed, implosion is somewhat safer unless, of course, you're in the building. Either way, if there's a plosion, it's bad. And so the problem is that some of us were like, oh, no, no, I, I'm not really angry. I don't want to acknowledge my anger. And you're imploding. And so you're dealing with un- incredible amounts of like bitterness, resentment, unforgiveness, and hatred, which are sins. Or honestly, you can also be dealing with physiological issues and stress and all kinds of other things, which are just not good for your body. So God's going, hey, why don't we go ahead instead of imploding and internalizing or exploding and letting everyone kind of just like get damaged themselves, why don't we acknowledge I'm angry? I'm angry. No matter what your style is, it's critical to acknowledge that you're angry, but don't stop there. Number two, restrain your immediate response. Those immediate responses, I tell you what, they often follow patterns that we learned in childhood. So again, with what we saw maybe or what we learned kind of was effective. If I throw a tantrum, everyone starts paying attention to me or something like that. Whether it was our parents or other adults, we kind of saw and learned some immediate responses. And it usually centers around one of two extremes. One is that venting, like flying off. And two, the other option is withdrawal or shutting down. So it's that kind of like, I'm just going to kind of like go away and shut down. And both end up being destructive. So... So you've learned these knee-jerk responses over time and experience, right? You've learned them. Colton, you're at least with me, yeah. Yeah, I know. So I'm going to just, since you've learned it, right? Yes? Which means that they're not inevitable. You learned your knee-jerk responses. You had lots of years to do it. You kind of got a lot of opportunity, a lot of source data, if you will, as a two-year-old. A lot of, a lot of source data was had, and you kind of figured out, oh, this is what, Again, I mentioned it already in the series, but I watched a kid at a photo shoot a couple weeks ago fly off and be all kinds of like, whoa, that kid's got some anger issues. And then I saw mom handle that kid. And I was like, I see where kid got the anger issue. Like, not the anger issue, but honestly, the way of responding to anger. His knee-jerk response was a learned one. So it's not inevitable. And so it can be relearned. 
It can be relearned and retooled, and that's why restraining that immediate response is really critical because you're going to go, pause, take a Kit Kat, you know, pause, and uh, let me just see what's going on here. And, and here's the reality, y'all. Y'all still with me? You may have little to no um, control over physiologically what's happening in you because your blood starts boiling. You start, like, physiologically, I understand. You might have this moment where, like, physiologically, you don't have as much control over the anger and the energy it gives you, but... What you do with that, how you choose to respond to that, you absolutely do have power to control. You and I both. We have the power to control that, as hard as it might be to imagine, but it's a matter of choosing in that moment. And it's those quick millisecond moments. I want to be wise and not a fool. Anybody? I want to be wise and not a fool. We've already read, actually, I'm not sure if we read this verse. Proverbs Proverbs 29, 11, new verse for the series. A fool gives full vent to his spirit, but a wise man quietly holds it back. So a fool goes, it's here, I'm going to let it, it's going to be, come out. In my immediate response, you're going to know it. And uh, a fool gives full vent. Well, is that, those are the options here. Are you going to hold back? Not in an unhealthy, dangerous way, as we're going to see. But are you going to wisely go, hey, 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 me? Like you're, calling, you're calming yourself down. Like, hey, me, no, 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 don't do that. Hold it back. Because only a fool will actually in that moment give full, um, give full vent. So count to 10. Wait a second. Breathe. Think. Yeah? Think. So let's look at another. We looked at one story, obviously, Cain and Abel. I want to look at another biblical story today, our only other story we're going to look at, of anger gone awry to help us keep moving through our five steps. 2 Kings 5, uh, 1 through 14 in the New American Standard says, Now Naaman, commander of the army of the king of Aram, was a great man. So he's a commander and he's a great man in the view of his master and eminent because by him the Lord had given victory to Aram. So we're intentionally by the storyteller meant to see this guy as pretty great, awesome, pretty cool, pretty powerful, pretty great. Like, you know, you see this? Commander, uh, great man in the view of his master, eminent because he's gotten lots of victory. So this is intentionally, I believe, storytelling to then get us to the part where it goes, um, the man was also a valiant warrior but afflicted with leprosy. So yeah, exactly. It's supposed to be this like, oh, that's not supposed to happen. Winner winning wins all the time, you know? And then all of a sudden, he's weak. So this valiant warrior suddenly has this um, weakness that not only is a weakness, but it ostracizes him from other people and all kind of stuff. So now the Arameans had gone out in bands and had taken captive a little girl from the land of Israel. And she waited on Naaman's wife. So she's the servant girl there at the house. And she said to her mistress, man, if only my master were with the prophet who is in Samaria, then he would cure him of his leprosy. And Naaman went in, having heard this, and told his master, saying, the girl who is from the land of Israel spoke such and such. Then the king of Aram said, well, go now, and I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So he departed and took with him 10 talents of silver, 6,000 shekels of gold, and 10 changes of clothing. So I want to tell you the whole story here because I sometimes we kind of go, let's just hit the main parts for our purposes. But I think this story is so interesting in the story of uh, Israel because you've got a man of God who's over there, uh, a young girl. You never know where God is going to position you to be the one voice who says, hey, I know a God who can do something. And so you might feel like the, the littlest, you know, most insignificant person in your sphere right now. But this little girl is kind of a hero in the story. She's like, I'll t- I-, I can tell you who can help you. So we get the change of clothing and all the... 6,000 shekels of gold and 10 talents of silver. And he brought the letter to the king of Israel, which said, and now as this letter comes to you, behold, I have sent Naaman my servant to you so that you may cure him of his leprosy. But when the king of Israel, who you would find if you read the whole story, not a godly guy, read the letter, he tore his clothes and said, am I God to kill and to keep alive that this man is sending word to me to cure a man of his leprosy? But consider now and see how he is seeking a quarrel against me. So he's freaking out. Yes? Okay. I just want you, I, that's why I kind of got a little bit dramatic here because he's freaking out. He's tearing his clothes. He's screaming. He's like, you're starting a fight with me. Friends, is he starting a fight with him? He literally is sending his servant, a commander in his army, to go get healed by some prophet that they believe was supposed to be able to heal him. So back to that whole self-focus thing, right? Last week, if you think it's all about you, you start interpreting a lot of situations funny. So anyway, now it happened when Elisha, the man of God heard that the king of Israel had torn his clothes, that he sent word to the king saying, um, why did you tear your clothes? Just have him come to me, and he shall learn that there is a prophet in Israel. Elisha's um, 
relationship with this king is really funny. You should go read this whole thing. It's really great because he's just like, you're a king. Pull yourself together. Send the guy to me. Uh, So Naaman came with his horses and his chariots and stood at the doorway of Elisha's house. And Elisha sent a messenger to him. Again, I know we don't have a whole lot of time, but guys, I just want you to see this. Like, Naaman's a big deal. And he kind of knows it. He's a commander of a great army who is very highly esteemed because highly esteemed because he's a valiant warrior who gets a lot of victories. A lot of W's, yeah? And he goes to meet this prophet in this foreign land with all these riches and all that. And Elisha's like, Oh, you hear the doorbell? Yeah, just go tell him to do this. He doesn't even get up and go to him. So So Elisha sent a messenger to him saying, go and wash in the Jordan seven times and your flesh will be restored to you and you will be clean. But Naaman was, yeah, so a little bit angry. He's furious and went away and he said, behold, I thought he will certainly come out to me and stand and call on the name of the Lord, his God, and like wave his hand over the site and cure the leprosy. Are Abana and Farpah, Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, not better than all the waters of Israel? Can I not wash in them and be clean? Basically, did I really need to travel all the way here? We got rivers back in Damascus. This is stupid. This is so dumb. So he turned and went away in a rage. Then his servants approached and spoke to him saying, hey, my father, had the prophet told you to do some like great thing, some really hard, crazy, great thing, wouldn't you have done that? So how much more then when he just says to you, go wash and be clean? Like, this is an easy thing. Like, just do, just do that. So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times in accordance with the word of the man of God, and his flesh was restored like the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. Sure enough, he didn't need to be angry after all. He didn't need to be angry. And the servants, his servants were the voice of reason that his immediate response when it was to go off and be, you know, how dumb is this whole thing? His servants were the voice of reason going, don't, don't go off. Like, hold off a little bit. Because he's thinking, what a waste of time, right? This prophet dude didn't even come out to me. He didn't even want to like come out and answer the door. He sent a servant. And then, and then um, I expected that this is how it was going to go. By the way, pause. Just like we talked about last week, how often is a, inflamed self-focus getting us to these expectations of what things should happen and how they should happen. Because Naaman's here totally justified, again, just like Jonah last week. Go watch it if you didn't see it. Um, And he's going, I I expected this to happen because I'm Naaman and I'm an expert in how the prophet of Israel heals people. No, but he, he had expectations. And so I expected him to come out to me for starters, stand up before me, holler at his God, wave a little bit over the spot, and uh, voila, or whatever ancient Aramean word for voila, I'd be healed, and that would be the end of it. And if it's just, you know, go in a river and then go home, I could have stayed home. This servant girl, no good servant girl, kind of getting me to come all the way out here. I don't know exactly even if it was the servant girl, if it was the prophet, if it was the, he was fuming about a lot. And we definitely know some of what it was because the servants got him talking. And that gets us to number number three. Locate the focus of your anger. Locate the focus of it. Just think, it's exactly what God asked Cain to do in the first account of anger in the Bible. The first account of anger in the Bible, what does God, the great counselor, do? He goes, hey, Cain, clearly you're angry. Why? Why are you so angry? Why is your face fallen? It's, again, I think we sometimes read these stories too quickly, and it's like God's going, hey, what's the focus of your anger? What's got you all worked out, worked up? And it may be a combination at times of anger at yourself for believing that they were better than that, and then also angry at that person for betraying your trust. It could be that you're angry at the family member that keeps on just, mm, and maybe angry at God for giving you that family member. You know, like it can be a combination of different things sometimes. And as we talked about in week one, a lot of times it's really good as we're trying to figure out the focus of our anger to recognize that anger is also often the source of actually a first feeling. It's a, it's a secondary feeling. So what is the hurt or the fear or the frustration that is the cause? What's the, the hurt that is causing me to feel this anger? What's the fear, the thing that I'm currently afraid of? What's the frustration? What is leading me to feeling so energized and heated? Because I think, honestly, for Naaman, get it from what we heard as his servants were getting him to talk, I think this mighty commander was actually feeling a bit hurt and sad. That he was overlooked. 
that like that this prophet didn't think he was as valuable as he thought he was, didn't want to come out and say hi to me, that you wasted my time having me come out here just to go into one of your rivers? Like there's rivers back home. I felt, I think he felt hurt and sad and felt embarrassed that he had like wasted all this time in his mind. Yes? And so his servants are getting him to slow down and focus your anger. And they're going, you're hurt because he gave you something simple to do. Because you're a valiant warrior, you like hard things. Anybody tracking? You like hard things. So you wanted this to be difficult and really costly, which is why you brought a lot of money. And instead it's free. And, oh man, this isn't even in the notes. Maybe that's why some of us struggle with the gospel. Because you wanted this to be hard. And instead it's, it's actually costing you everything because you're laying your life down, but you didn't really have to do anything because Jesus did it all. Okay, well, I need to do it. No, that's the thing. So, so Naaman is, is hurt, and that leads him to anger. And it's so important that we figure out what's going on with our anger and where it's coming from, because anger can sometimes seem aimless, but aimless anger never produces positive results. Aimless anger never produces positive results. If you want to get some, something positive out of your anger, what, do a little bit of diagnosing, what's going on here? Why am I, it was funny, actually, I got coffee with uh, Jonathan Crook the other day, guy here at Alive, in case you haven't met him, and um, we were talking about the week one of this series, and how he had got, had a guy, as he was driving, with his window down, in a motorcycle, go past his car, and as this motorcycle passed him, it revved up real loud, and startled him, and his immediate response was to be angry. He was like, that was kind of frustrating. Anybody else had somebody, like, scare you while you're driving? Like, and, and then he realized, he's like, it's so funny, because this series, I'm realizing, I was afraid. It kind of startled me. It made me afraid. And that, I don't like being afraid, so that made me angry. And I could kind of kind of go, oh, hold on a second. They weren't attacking me. I, they're gone. I don't need to be afraid. He was able to process his anger in a healthier way because he did this step of going, where's the focus? It's basically, if you don't do this, if you're just aimless, it's like going blindfolded into the medicine cabinet every morning and being like, what's it going to be today? <laughs> you don't want to do that. You need to know what you have and also what you're taking for it to be healthy. So if you're going to handle your anger in a constructive and God-honoring way, okay, what's going on here? Let's take the blindfold off. Let's look at what do I have, what do I need, what's going on here? And that's why it's good for us to pause, which is going to be actually more on that next week. But locate the focus of your anger and get, the, get that sense of where the hurt, fear, and frustrations are. And then after you've done that, it's time to move towards some action. Step four, analyze your options. Analyze your, one more time, analyze your options. Like, do you want to yell at the restaurant owner to their face or create about a dozen fake profiles on, on Yelp and leave them all scathing reviews? Options. Like, do you want to gossip about that one uh, coworker that you can't stand or just accidentally throw all of the things that have their name on it in the communal fridge into the trash can? Options. Like, do you analyze your options. Do you want to yell back at your tantrum-throwing little child or maybe hit your bottle during their nap time? Uh, options. Do you want to passively, passive-aggressively withhold intimacy from your spouse or do you want to proactively buy that thing that you know they're going to be ticked once you find out that you bought that? Yeah, options. Do you want to respond to your, your neighbor, your apartment neighbor's late night loud music with maybe some early morning loud music of your own? Or do you want to gleefully just watch as they struggle with their groceries to come inside during a pouring down rain with your tea in hand as you watch smiling? Options. These are not the options I'm talking about. <laughs> these, these are not the options that we're here talking about. In fact, actually, uh, I wanted to point out those options because anger can very often make us very loveless people, right? And Jesus once said, hey, if you're to distill the commands of God, the desires that God has for your life, you could sum it up, love God with everything that you have, and then love your neighbor as yourself. And anger can often make us very loveless people. So the options aren't these. We need to determine some, some better and healthier ways than we maybe have in the past even handled our anger. And to do that, we've got to stop prettying up some of the unhealthy things that we've done and the ways that we operate. Some of us are like, listen, listen, I, I speak my mind. But you know what? People always know where they stand with me. And instead, what you're doing is you're prettying up the fact that you have an indiscretion over what you say and how you say it and how you explode. 
So you're like, well, people know, you know, people know what they're getting. It's like, yeah, but they're not getting a loving person. Uh, I, you know, some of us, we pretty it up and we say, I hate conflict and avoid it at all costs. Well, maybe you're just prettying up a, a fearfulness and a cowardice that has left so many un- important things unamended in your life and unresolved. And that's hurting you and others because you haven't actually dealt with these important things. Sometimes we pretty up things like, I don't have time or energy for fill in the blank, so I'm just moving along. I'm just going to move along. Which, if you do it in a healthy way, okay, as long as you're moving along from a situation, which we're going to get to in just a second. But some of us, when we say that, we're actually just moving along from a relationship. And we're like, cutting, you're out. I don't have time for that. I don't have energy for that. And actually what you're doing is you're putting up unhealthy ways that you relate to people where you cut ties instead of making peace. And one of those things is actually what Jesus invited his followers to do. It's to make peace, be peacemakers. So biblically, here are the two options. Those of you who are note takers or those of you who should be. Um, the two options for when we're analyzing our options are you overlook or you confront. Okay? And let me give you the scripture for uh, both of them. Overlook. It's Proverbs 19.11, which we did look at before. Um, it says, good sense makes one slow to anger, and it is his glory to overlook an offense. It's to your glory to go ahead when the moment is right and go, you know what, not a big deal. If it's truly not a big deal, okay? And that's why it's so valuable for us to sometimes have that threshold thing that we talked about last week raised up a little bit to some healthy places where it's like, listen, I'm not expecting perfection from people. I'm expecting that people are going to do some things that I have to bear with, as we talked about last week. So anyway, it's to your glory to have things that you're genuinely, did you catch that big, important adverb? Genuinely overlooking. I just feel like I got to be, because sometimes we're like, oh, I'm going to overlook that and remember it. I'm going to overlook that and keep that in the satchel. Yep, I'm carrying that one with me. I'm going to overlook it, but when I stop overlooking, it's not, you're, you're going to get so many things that I've been overlooking dumped on you. you. If you can overlook it, overlook it. It's truly, man, I, here's the thing. I am so grateful for people in my life who are close and in a relationship with me, who love me enough, and I probably don't even know it because that's how it works, to overlook a lot of my faults and failures. I'm glad the Lord is willing to do that. But you can't always do that. And so while there's some biblical evidence for overlooking, there's also a lot of biblical evidence for confronting in healthy ways. And there's a process that Jesus himself gave for confronting. We're going to look at it together. Matthew 18, starting in verse 15, Jesus says, here's the process for how you confront. Everybody paying attention? Because this is like Jesus telling you how to deal with interpersonal conflict. So if you want to follow Jesus, which I know many of us do, and if you want to ever figure out when you, again, I know it's rare that you would ever have interpersonal conflict, but if you should ever find yourself in the remainder of your life having it, here's what he tells you to do. If your brother sins against you, go and tell uh, a bunch of your friends his fault. Go and, bu- go, go and talk to your pastor about his fault. Go and uh, post, s- subtweet, go ahead and subtweet about his fault. No, it says go talk to them. So I just want to always encourage you. I know this is, for those of you who are anti-confrontational, the, the scariest part of it, maybe right off the bat, but it's biblical. Go and talk to them um, between you and them alone. If he listens to you, you've gained your brother back. Good. Whew. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. That, that every charge part, this is a Jewish tradition. As far as their judicial system, they had this tradition of going like, listen, for big things, we need two or three witnesses to verify. So he's kind of quoting their Old Testament law. And if he refuses then, once you get that two or three in there, well, then you got to take it to the church. You're you're escalating the thing in a healthy way. You got to take it to the church. And if he refuses to even listen to the church, which, by the way, brings in greater wisdom, because sometimes you get it to the church level and the church goes, actually, this isn't that big of a deal. You should... Or you can bring some moderation. It can bring insights. It can kind of bring the nuance into it, and it can refine it. But at the end of the day, Jesus says, hey, if you bring it to the church and they still refuse to listen even to the church, let him be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector, which for Jesus doesn't mean you look down on them and think they're trash. It just means you recognize they are willfully living apart from the grace of God and need to be prayed for that they would come back into that. And so, truly I say to you, Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And again, I say to you, if two or three, or sorry, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there am I among them. And uh, again, I just want to make sure that we see that this is where this verse shows up in Scripture. 
It's not about as much like our worship gatherings or a prayer meeting. It's about Jesus going, I'm going to be, my presence is going to be profoundly, powerfully present when we strive for reconciliation in this way. In this way of going, I don't want to, but I'm going to do it. All right, let's have the conversation. Okay, it didn't really go that well. Okay, let's get a couple of people to go ahead and maybe tell me that I'm wrong. You know what I'm saying? Like, this is difficult, but Jesus is saying, because of that, I'm gonna, my, presence, my presence is going to be with you in it. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to help you, which, man, some of us need that promise. And here's what I would suggest, because, again, I know today's highly practical. Here's four things that I suggest you do when you confront somebody when you do have that conversation. Here we are. Share information. Gather information. Negotiate understanding. Request change. So here's what happened from my vantage point. And you want to share information, not make accusation. Did you catch that? Here's the information that I have from my vantage point of what happened in this situation. And then the gather information presumes that I don't have all the information. It goes and says, can you help me understand why this happened or what's going on here? Can you give me your, you gather information, you ask questions of the other person. And in that, you then negotiate understanding. Okay, well, do you understand, you you ask the questions, you have the conversation that goes, okay, now that we both kind of have a sense of things, do you see where I'm coming from and why this would be hurtful for me? Like, I know you meant well, but when you, you know, totally, I don't know, ignored me in that moment, it felt like I was nothing to you or whatever the situation might be. You negotiate understanding and then you request change. Hey, in the future, when you come in, if you're really busy, would you just say a quick hello to me? That way I know we're still good and that you're not angry with me. You request change. Does this seem healthy? It's a really, I think, a smart and healthy way of biblically and godly handling the, the, the moment. You go, okay, here's, here's the information. Here's the situation. Let me understand from you, which, again, is so critical because sometimes we go right from point one to, like, four, yeah. skipping two and three. We're like, here's the situation, and if this is ever going to happen again, this is what you need to do. Yeah. Time out. Take the Kit Kat again. It'll pause a little bit and, and go, okay, where, where do I need to learn and grow? And then back to Cain. Didn't God tell him, if you do well, will you not be accepted? Like God wants us to confront the things that are angering us, but he wants us to do it in the healthiest ways so that we can be accepted and so that it can lead to life. So that leads us to our final step, that after you've acknowledged that, yes, you are angry, and you've restrained that immediate knee-jerk reaction until you've had time to reflect for at least a second, you've located the focus of your anger, and you've analyzed your options, you finally, you take constructive action. And that constructive action, I know I just went into it, but that might actually be going through that conversation and having the confrontation moment, confronting that person about that situation. That might be the action step, and that might be the sum of all you do to appropriately use that energy that's been produced in you for some good. You have the conversation, it's good, cool, cool. That's it. Sometimes there's other actions that come out of it too. Yeah? Like sometimes there's a sense of like, hey, Josh, I am so sorry. Now that you've confronted me and dealt with this, I think I need to make it up for you, make it up to you. And if I stole your bike, I need to give you that bike back or something like that. You know, like you had a nice bike and I wanted it. You, you make the change that is going to make amends. Um, but let me just tell you, actually, I know we can get into what you should do. Can I just encourage you guys on what you shouldn't do? And I, I know um, some of this is from that book I mentioned already, but like, um, Modern psychology definitely has put it to the whole like punching a pillow and getting your anger out like by breaking something that's pointless or something like that, but you know, blowing off some steam. And here's one of the reasons I want, I think we need to really get that because some of us were like, um, that works for me. And I just want to encourage you, it doesn't. And again, science as well as like, there's nothing scripturally behind it. I'll just tell you that. Nothing in scripture goes, all right, go blow off some steam, go punch some walls or anything like that because well, I'm better I punch a wall than I punch a person. Here's the problem. Anger is not, and I wish I had a great illustration, but I couldn't come up with it, so we're going to picture it, okay? Anger is not a bottle of water that once you pour it out, there's less of it in there. I vented it. I went ahead, and I just let it out in this way, and so there's less of it. It's actually the the ground, and the more you pour and the more it finds a pathway, it learns that pathway. In other words, we're thinking, oh, I'm blowing off some steam, punching this wall. No, you're learning the pathway of I'm angry, I get physical, Or I'm going to go scream and yell and stuff like that, but I'm not going to yell at the person. You're learning. I get angry. I get heated and yell. So it's why it's so important for us to learn and go, you know what? 
this is not a matter of letting this anger kind of have its way. I'm here to control it, which is why Ecclesiastes 7, 9 told us it's supposed to be a temporary visitor, anger is, not a guest that lodges within us. So we're processing this as healthy as we can, as quickly as we can. And so we should pray about it. Yeah? And acknowledge the Lord in it, seeking his wisdom. God, what do you want me to do about this? Because I'm feeling pretty lit up. I'm slowing down. I'm asking you, what, what can I do? What should I do? I really think, if you get nothing else, I have no one-liner, by the way, today. So if you get nothing else, I think maybe this is it. That would be really good for us in these moments of anger to have a quick one-sentence prayer. Um, Lord, I want to handle this in a way that honors you. Or even just saying out loud, this is a moment where I could really please the Lord. Because God looked at Cain and said, oh, I want to accept you. I want this to be a moment that you can please me. Cain has the decision moment. And and so you and I in these moments, this can be a moment where I can please the Lord. Can you imagine how interesting it would be when the next time you get really heated, you said that out loud? This could be a moment where I can please the Lord. Then you're going to be like, ah, I guess I can't go off now. I guess I can't just, you know, really sarcastically or whatever your, your way would be. And, um, and I know I already said it, but like, let me recommend to you guys, because we just, we don't have the time to imagine all of the possible, possible practical next steps for what you can do. But if you want to read a book, we get that book that I mentioned earlier by Gary Chapman, Anger, um, because it goes into a lot of that stuff about how you can practically handle it. And I just think, honestly, practically, if you need help beyond prayer, which you absolutely should do, talk to me as your pastor or seek a professional counselor, Christian counselor. And make sure they know how to properly handle anger in a godly way. And get some people around you that also love the Lord that can be counseled to you as well. Don't just do this alone. It really is hard for me, even sometimes, when I'm most worked up, to be most wise. Which is why the book of wisdom tells us get counselors, get counselors around you. But you can learn to best get the best of anger when you acknowledge God in all of those moments. Trusting him, leaning on him. So I want to end with Proverbs 3, 5 through 8. Because it invites us to say, trust in the Lord with all of your heart, even those parts of your heart that get angry, all of it. And don't lean on your own understanding of what you think is the best way to handle this moment that's getting you all furious and rage-filled. In all your ways, in all of your ways, in all your ways, acknowledge him. So notice, acknowledging him means this is a moment where I could please the Lord. God's here. He's with me. The Holy Spirit wants to help me. He's going, hey, come on, self-control. You can rule over it. So I'm going to acknowledge him, and then he's going to make my path straight. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. And then, it doesn't end there. It says, it will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Sounds pretty great, doesn't it, friends? Doesn't that sound like a good option? That's the fruit of one approach. Cain got the fruit of the other approach, because he didn't listen, and it pushed him away from God, and it ended up letting, having him be exiled from a relationship with other people as well. And I don't want the enemy to steal, kill, or destroy in your life because of anger. So it's got to be a battle that we overcome by the power of the Holy Spirit and self-control and wisdom so that, that the wisdom that he brings so that better things can come from our anger than what has happened in the past. Self-control and anger, as we were kind of getting into this message, kind of made me think of Incredible Hulk. And I was like, I can't just offer the same thing that Marvel offers. But I will just say that as I was reading the, um, the book, you know, the, again, I referenced a couple times, Gary Chapman talks about a moment where he's in his office having a counseling ses- session with a couple. And this guy knocks on the church office, pounds and pounds and pounds. And he comes out, he's like, hello? He starts raging at him about the, the speed bump in the church parking lot and how it messed up his car. And he starts going off on him, this whole thing. And as I'm reading his account of how he slowed down and listened to the man, and then tell me again what happened. You know what? That would be really frustrating if my car had just gotten damaged. I would be pretty upset about that as well. And as he masterfully navigated this guy through acknowledging his anger, what's the focus of it? Why did this make you angry? And processing it in a way that goes, I care, and I'm, I'm concerned with you. I'm here with you. And the guy actually self-diagnosed as, I've handled my anger poorly, and it got the best of me. I'm so sorry. And then it was like this. I'm reading this going, that's like some 
some masterful Jedi trick or something like that. How, as he's doing this whole thing, I'm like, sometimes counselors are just amazing. I don't know how they do it. And, and of course, that's the one you put in your book. When you're writing a book, you put that one, you put that one in there. But I'm reading it, I'm going, oh my gosh, like it just seems like that guy's got superpowers. Forget Incredible Hulk. Gary Chapman has superpowers to be able to handle this guy's anger in this way. And you know what's interesting? I've heard it said before that the actually the hardest person for you and I to lead is ourselves. And so while it might be hard for us to imagine leading others to ha- handle their angry, their anger in productive ways, which by the way, we're gonna get to in actually I think two weeks in the series. We're gonna talk about some real practical ways to help others process their anger in godly ways. I think if I can learn first how to handle my own better, that's where some amazing things happen. That's where it's like, whew, that's like almost superpowers. Not because of my own strength, obviously, but you need to have the tools and then you need to have the Holy Spirit empowering you so that when the moment comes where sin is crouching at your door, where its desire is contrary to you, it wants, whereas you want to like thrive and live life to the fullest, abundant life that Jesus promised you, sin wants to go ahead and steal, kill, and destroy. But in that moment, we learn that there's another option, that we can actually, in this moment, we can actually please the Lord. So just imagine with me as we end today, as the worship team comes up, um, if in the next moment, and not just the next one moment, but in the next year, your moments of getting angry could be more and more and more Christ honoring, that you could go ahead and have these moments where Jesus is glorified more and more in the moments where actually he historically has been kind of most pushed to the side. Dustin, you got something you wanna share? I had to do some yelling this morning, not out of anger, but so to describe the circumstance, and this is really perfect. So we had an incident on the plane this morning that uh, someone was asleep and somebody had budged them and they got very angry, thought that somebody had actually punched them to the point of their response was to scream and yell profanities, rip off their dreadlocks, and then all in front of their eight-year-old kid and, you know, it gets to this point where you're like, okay, you're going to settle down now. And somebody makes a comment and then he just keeps going off and off. And, uh, man, he really is a stereotype of what you would imagine for, uh, did anybody see anger management with Adam Sandler? Yeah. Yeah, So kind of like, like that essentially. So if we can pray for this man, because he may actually go to prison, uh, jail at least, his kid just witnessed all of this. He saw a lot of people accusing his dad and saying horrible things about his dad. So this man just lost all of his dignity in front of his kid. So let's pray that one, the Lord is able to minister to him by whatever means he wants to, and that he would actually be able to hear from his kid, Dad, I forgive you for everything that just happened. All right. Yep. Our Father in heaven, we come before you in prayer. In the gift of mediation of your son, Jesus, your means of mercy towards us, which we are grateful for, for the gospel that comes through him. Please have mercy on this man, this sinner, as you've had mercy on us. And whoever you choose, they'd be a good instrument, a wonderful instrument to counseling him, ministering to him, and the same to his son. And that he'd be able to honestly openly confess everything he's struggling with. And he received mercy, despite however it may look. And someone is able to work with his son. And uh, if this has been a habit long term, he's probably going to be hearing, you can't forgive your dad. Your dad's an awful person. Stay away from him. He's dangerous. He's risky. You just get as far away as you can. But God, work mercy, work love. And this father be able to hear from his son audibly, not just hypothetically, oh, I'm sure your son forgives you, despite you made such good progress. No, he genuinely hear, dad, I forgive you for everything you've done. So we ask this in Jesus' name, and we worship you now. Amen.